bless you, ladies and gentlemen. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and, and start this morning. I want to talk about the increase in the covenant of increase. Uh, you know, God is a God of increase. God is a God of, 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 uh, of, of prosperity. God is a God of, of greatness. God is a good God. He's a good father. You know, I'm a father, and now I'm a grandfather, and then uh, I'm excited that we're expecting our, our let's say, uh, fourth grandbaby. And all girls, this one's going to be a boy, praise God. Amen. And so I'm excited. But, uh, you know, the responsibility of, of having children is so wonderful, so great. It's a big responsibility, but it's such a blessing because as a father, uh, I've always blessed my children. I've always had the best for them. Um, I've always believed the best for them. And, and, you know, whenever they've asked for something, I would always say, well, let's just pray and believe God. You know, so we would always believe God. And uh, that's the heart of our father. Our heart of a father loves us. He doesn't want you hurt. He wants to protect you. He always wants you to have plenty. It's not God's will for you to lack in any way. Say with me, I, I should not lack. It's not God's plan. And if, if we'll get hold of um, the attitude that, well, God is teaching me something. No, God doesn't use lackness to teach you. If you're in lack, then he'll use that opportunity to grow you. And I know that I've been in, in want when early in my life, and uh, he grew me how to believe the Lord. I found out the way to increase in, the, in, in, in areas that you're asking God for is to grow in the Word. No more of the Word. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can tell you, the world says you need certain things to buy certain things, to have certain things, and I'm here to tell you you don't. The world says you need to have a certain amount of credit to buy something. Credit's good to have. But I found out that if you trust God, God can do supernaturally abundantly what you can ask him for. I stand before you as a witness. I stand before you as a person. I've seen God in every area. And so I, I can tell you this, that uh, I learned something from the Lord. First of all, I found out that he's a good father. He's a good daddy. I love him. He loves me. And he wants to take care of us. But the Bible is full of his promises. So we're going to cover something so so powerful but yet so so easy if we will get a hold of that now notice this um, there's three levels of faith number one there is great faith there is little faith and there's no faith right now you're using little faith sitting on these chairs that's little faith so when you came in you knew those chairs were going to hold you up i could have came last night and took all the screws out of it and you would have found fast that chair didn't hold you up. So in other words, you use a little faith. But Jesus talked about great faith, little faith, and no faith. No faith is people that are doing things apart from God. Although they're using a certain amount of faith that they don't realize they're using when they turn their car on, they expect their car to start. That, that's a sense of faith. So if that attitude of turning on your car knowing it's going to start, why shouldn't we have an attitude knowing that the Word of God will always work? You see what I'm saying? Say with me, amen. And so we have to realize that the Word of God will take you out of no faith into little faith, but the desire is to get you to great faith. So in other words, you need to grow from no faith to little faith to great faith. So how's it going to take? By expressing the word over you and allowing the word to work. Now notice this. Rem just remember the days that minister to you. Just remember the days that minister to you. Uh, and uh, think about those things there that are taking place. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And let's look at something. Hallelujah. The Bible declares... Genesis 26. Go with me to Genesis 26. Oh, he's so good. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I'm going to read it to you from the Message Bible, but listen to what it says in, in Genesis 26, verses 12. Are you there? Genesis 26, verses 12. Isaac planted crops in that land, a huge harvest. Come on, church. Isaac planted crops in that land and took in a huge harvest. God blessed him. The man, listen to what it says, got richer and richer by the day until he was wealthy. Progression right here. He accumulated flocks, herds, 
and many, many servants so much that the Philistines began to envy him. Now that's true. The enemy, which is Satan and all the, the people or the enemies that he uses, will be, be, will, be um, will take note of your blessing. And they will want to know why you're blessed. And that's what happened here. Now notice this. There's a progression. Rich to rich is a progression that enters into wealth. That's the Bible says that. The Bible believes in wealth. As I said earlier, there's a lot of bad apples that make you think that's not God's will. It is God's will. Have you ever noticed that people of wealth that are ungodly, people do not complain about their wealth. But the moment a good person, a good woman, a good man has wealth, people will complain. Come on, church. And this is, this is the enemy's fault. The enemy doesn't want the believer, the righteous, to have wealth. He'd rather keep that wealth among themselves and cause destruction among themselves. You know, people that do not serve the Lord are wealthy. Not all of them, but there's many that will destroy their lives because of wealth. Come on, church, you know that. You know that. But there's a plan that God has for every believer. Now notice this. Uh, and I want, what, I'm, what the Lord is trying to illustrate to us today is that our mindset has to be apart from the world. We have to think apart. Uh, that uh, being a Christian doesn't mean you need to be poor and humble. Only poor people go to church. That's a lie of the devil. Uh, only... Only people that serve God uh, because of their humbleness, they, 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 money will destroy them. That's a lie of the devil. Money does not destroy people. Uh, the love of money destroys people. When you start loving money, then you're, you're toward a path of destruction. Because the more that you love, the more money, the more that you're going to spend, the more you're going de to destroy your lives, whatever it may be, credit here, whatever, the more you're going to spend. How many people know that you can get two jobs and you'll be spending more money? But if you'll trust God where you are now in the word and, try, and apply the word over your finances, you'll know that God's desire is to use what you have because it's not love uh, that you love that money, but to, have what you, to use what you have that God will increase it in a great way. Say so with me, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe that. And so we have to realize something that uh, uh, we must learn to trust the Lord, trust his word, but not only trust and learn his word, but rest. Say with me, rest. Rest in his word. Have total confidence that he's working. Don't be apprehensive. Don't, don't get all knotted up with stress because it's not working. Just rest in his word. The energy that you use in worrying, are you with me, church? The energy you use for worrying and this and fighting and striving, you know what I'm talking about, I mean, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, not necessarily fighting, but worry, worry about bills and worry. The strength that you use there, use that strength and turn it over and use strength to rest in God. What does that mean? Say, Father, no. You're in control. You're in control. Oh, no, you're in control. What are you doing? You're, you're taking that strength that you use there, that energy, Bring it into rest. Learn to rest in His promise because in the rest is the confidence that you need in the Word. When you don't rest, anything, in any area, um, if you're having stress, then stress affects you in many ways. Your, your, your future is toward a heart attack. Your future will be high blood pressure. Uh, your future will be It'll affect you in many ways. But if you'll take resting in his word, it'll alleviate all that anguish, and then it'll work towards you in the area that you're believing God. When Pastor Christine was diagnosed with, with cancer, we immediately had to rest in that word. When we took Pastor Christine for her tests and her schedules and, and her treatments, uh, what I saw people were really struggling with cancer I, I, to sit in a, in a lobby with people struggling with cancer, you can see the pain and the hurt. And yet we had to learn to rest in His Word and know that God is on the scene. God is doing a well thing. In fact, people, uh, um, uh, technicians, doctors, nurses, and receptions would always tell us, we're so excited when you guys come, you just gather this, lighten this room up. 
I know what they mean. Because we come with the joy of the Lord. We know that God is doing something. And we talk to people. I'll talk to husbands as their wives are being treated or vice versa. We're encouraging people. Tell them that, that, that you can be excited that God's on the scene if you trust him. There was a woman that had brain cancer we got to meet. And uh, she was so, uh, her whole family was there. And she would come to treatment every time Christine would come to visit the doctor. So we would, we, she was like 30 minutes before us, so we would sit. And I asked her, do you mind if we pray with you? And oh, she said, yes. We prayed and we got to pray and we got to know them and laugh. And, and it wasn't long till I saw her having joy coming to the doctor. She would say, do, do, Pastor, do you want some coffee? I said, I sure do. And so we were having a good time waiting for treatments to come in. You see what happens? The, the stress level started changing her because of the joy of God. And, and I know that that healing, that stress was reduced and that healing started coming. And, and listen, what does God do? God does things. He loves us. Hallelujah. Amen. And so this is where we have to realize. So I mean, there's a covenant that God has for us. And in this case... Isaac got under a covenant of blessing. Now think, what he's, think, now think about it. The Bible says he went to a desert place that God told him to go. Looked at this desert place and said, all right, God. Now, if it was you and me before Jesus, we'd say, well, now, who, what am I going to do with all these rattlesnakes and these scorpions and nothing grows out here. Oh, why do I have to come to the desert? God, God, you don't love me. God, you're just trying to kill me. You just want me to be bull, poor and die. No, no, no. Isaac said, amen. The Bible says he started having increase. Planted. He started having increase of crop. He started having herds. He started having an increase so much that he had servants. He provided jobs for people that lived in the desert to have jobs. And, and he became rich and rich until he became wealthy. It's a progress. It has to start somewhere. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to start with his word so that I can end in his word. Come on, church. Now, notice this. We have to have a concept that this is true. Tell me, this is true. The word of God is so true that if you'll stay on that and stay with it, stay with it, you'll see. There was a man years ago that uh, got out of prison, told him uh, you need to stay in this halfway house. Uh, people would come and he would try for jobs and, uh, you know, being in prison, he had a hard time being hired. And uh, the jobs that he would do, it was jobs that nobody wanted. And of course, uh, you know, he would have to do this. But one day... Uh, he, he got a hold of the Lord. He got a hold of Jesus, got saved, started going to church. And the pastor asked him, would you cut the grass of our church? He said, yes, sir. So the pastor provided a lawnmower. He started cutting the grass of the church. And then the, the next door neighbor of that church asked uh, him, would you cut my grass? Yes, sir, I would. And so what happened? He says, huh, I can do this. So he borrowed the church's lawnmower and started making some money. Pastor knew it, and what happened? It wasn't long before he bought a lawnmower. Now, notice this. He didn't have a truck or anything. He was pushing a lawnmower. He started cutting neighbors' yards, making some money, and from that moment on, he got some help to buy some lawnmower, another lawnmower, and for that time, he bought him a little truck, a little old Ford Ranger, a beat-up Ford Ranger, bought a truck and started going. And do you know he's in Chicago today, has one of the largest, one of the largest, largest company that literally remodels and plants. Uh, he's into, what do you call it? Uh, landscaping. One of the largest landscaping companies in the state, in the, in the city of Chicago. And uh, he's got, oh my, and still goes to that same church, still goes and very wealthy. And he'll get up and talk to people and young people, young kids that are uh, hurting, that maybe are coming out of prison, whatever. He says, uh -uh, you just trust God. God will do it. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Amen. I got to see him one day, got to the pulpit and shared his testimony. I'm telling you, stirred me up to know God is a God that can do the impossible. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Amen. And so let's find out some. Go with me to the book of Acts now. Are you with me, church? I want you to walk out of here excited that God can do it. If he did it for other people, he could do it for me. Hallelujah. Amen. He can do it. And I want you to be blessed in your life. 
in your walk with God. Hallelujah. God will do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Acts the 10th chapter. I know that. Yeah. Acts 10 verse 34. The Bible says this in, in chapter 10 of verses 34. The Bible says, Peter, are you with me? Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. If God will do it for Isaac, if God will do it for that poor woman that had to sell oil just to make a living, if God will do it for that other woman that they try to arrest her children and put them in, bond, in slaves because she owed the king some money or the, uh, the uh, seller. If I can believe that he did that, if he blessed that man with that lawnmower job, if he did it for me, if he did it for others that are wealthy, he could do it for you. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Come on, church. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. There's a man in Texas that was working for an old company, had a vision that instead of, instead of buying pipe, he can buy old pipe, drilling pipes, drilling that go on the ground. He can buy the old pipe. And he, he had a dream of a welding machine that went in this pipe and was just welding inside, inside, inside. And he started believing God and he found a way to, to get this working and today he is one of the large pipe producers in the oil field of selling me a manufactured tubing a born again believer millionaire billionaire selling oil ref, refurbished oil bits i perceive god is no respect of persons i perceive say with me i perceive Meaning that Peter saw something here. I, I perceive, I perceive, I perceive. If God prospers one person, he doesn't choose and say, I won't prosper you. Now notice this. God does not do that. Now God will, will prosper a person that believes in the word and stands in that word. And the other person may not believe the word. It doesn't mean that God stopped him. It means that he did allow the word to work for him. God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't see your color over some other color. God doesn't see your education over another education. God doesn't see that. God sees faith in us. Come on, church. He sees love for the word. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, church. Now, the devil will make people wealthy. I've heard, I've heard movie stars or recording artists sell their lives to, record, to make recordings, and he'll do that. Come on, church. I, I, know, I know people that sell drugs and make a lot of money, but their day's coming. Come on, church. But I know people that, that are very wealthy in the kingdom of God, and God uses them mightily for his kingdom, and they're people that are just like you and me. There may be people in this house right now that are wealthy. Come on, church. Amen. Well, I know there's some. Hallelujah. Amen. Think about it. In this room, I believe there's people that God wants them to have a heart to be millionaires. Now, come on, church. You ought to say amen. Come on, church. It's, amen. Say it with me. That's me. Say it again. That's me. Hallelujah. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with trusting God. I, I get so uptight with people talk about, well, God wants you poor. Well, tell me in the Bible where that says that. Well, God doesn't want you to have all that money. You need to give all that money to poor people. Well, well how is the church going to take care of itself? How is the church going to do other things? See, people are always out there. I, oh, I got to be careful. I'm online. Amen. I can tell you story after story of people that I hear, that I correct, and I hear the response. I hear, well, I apologize, Pastor. Now I know what you mean. Do you know something? Oh, I, I, oh let me just stay focused here. That's, that's, my, that's me trying to get out of that. Amen. Go with me to John now. Thank you, Lord. Keep me focused, Lord. John 17. I want you to see John 17, verses 14. Hallelujah. Jesus said this, it's written in red. If Jesus says it, listen to what Jesus says. Amen. John, John 17, verses 14. Hallelujah. Amen. I have given them thy word, and the world hath, hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Notice this. We become transformed by the word. Jesus, I have given them the word, and the world hateth them, because they are not of the world. So in other words, it's the word that's going to transform you, not the world. 
An average person that goes to college doesn't really know what their degree will be. It's, a, it's, a, it's statistically known that they'll change it four to five times. It's because they don't know. And that's true. Many don't know. You know, it, it, people are just running every time. They're, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to buy. I don't know. What kind of car are you? I, I don't know. I just want a car. I don't know. Even in the restaurants, well, what are you going to eat? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's almost like somebody has to make up their mind for them. You know, I tell my wife when we go to a restaurant or somewhere, I said, what is your first choice, honey? That's the easiest thing to do, honey. What is your first choice? Oh, that works. It really does, your first choice. If you trust God in the word, then every time you have a decision, it'll be that first choice that'll come up because of God. God doesn't have you say, ah, 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 ah. no, no. Uh, okay, now say it with me. It's the word. It's the word that'll transform you. And so if the word will transform us, now listen to this, uh, those that are watching and you that are here, if the word will transform you, then the word is truth. And if the truth, if the word is truth, then truth works. Isn't that so simple? Truth works. God gives me the truth and it works every time. The word, Jesus said, I have given them your word and the world hates them. Well, that's, that's obvious. The world hates the world. The, the world hates the word. People don't have time to sit under the word, but then they have so much time to have the problem. And the word is trying to help them. You know, as a pastor, I see people, they want a quick fix. And I know that God doesn't work that way. But I do know if they will get in that word, the word will fix it. But people don't have time for the word. So they go after the world and the world just keeps giving them wrong decisions. Wrong decisions, making wrong choices. And so the word fixes us. Say what me, it does. Look at Romans now, Romans the 12th chapter. We're just, we're using a lot of supported scriptures here. Jesus says, I give them the word and the word is the truth. The word is the truth. Say with me, the word is the truth. And so I'd rather get the word and have patience enough to trust the word so that the word can work in my life. I've been there too long. I bought too many t-shirts, wore the same thing over and over. I'm going to trust the word now. I'm going to trust the word now. What does the word say over this situation? In Romans, the 12th chapter. Now, notice what it says. Paul, speaking to the church at Rome. These are very smart people, the church of Rome. Educated people. So Paul is speaking to an educated group of people. These are people that know history, that know uh, science, that know astrology, that know the Greek interpretations of, of, of uh, Greekology or whatever you want to call it, right? Now, notice what it says here. Verses 1, I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, so right there tells us he's talking to the converted Romans, Romans that were converted. He doesn't call the world brothers, he calls the church brethren. It's like me saying, hi, sister and brother. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So in other words, I want you to get this. It talks about... Presenting your body a living sacrifice. A lot of people take this out of context and say, well, you need to know what you need to live holy before the Lord. That's where we get religion where it comes in and says women should not wear pants and stay away from all that stuff. Uh, makeup. Oh, I, I hate all that religious stuff. He's not talking about what you wear. He's not talking about that. He's talking about your personal life. Just surrender your your life to Jesus. Make it a sacrifice unto Jesus. Come on, make your life a sacrifice. He doesn't talk about your outerwear. Your outerwear is not going to save you. Come on, Tertullian. Well, let me say it this way. It's not going to make you go to heaven what you're wearing. Now, it'll save you here if you're naked in this town. You see, but, but it's talking about going to heaven. Now, that's what he's talking about here. So, in other words, present your body as a living sacrifice, which is a reasonable service. Reasonable means it's not hard, church. Be reasonable. It's not hard. If you're, if you're in a dilemma... Take the word and let the word give, have patience in the word and just present your body unto God a living sacrifice. And it's not hard to do. It's not, it, it be reasonable. It's not hard to do. I want to say it again. It's not hard to do. What makes it hard is we don't, not we in this room, the people that make it hard. We don't believe the word. That, that settles it. 
If people don't believe the word, then there's nothing you can do, and it's going to be hard. But the thing about it is, if you become a believer of that word, and you stick with it, you stay with that word. I don't care what the winds uh, of adversity come, you stay with it. Uh, it's like an eagle. Have you ever studied an eagle? And, and I'm going to talk about that maybe in the next sermon, but, but an eagle doesn't fly with other birds. Eagles, eagles don't fly with buzzards. <laughs> eagles don't fly with parakeets. Eagles don't fly with pigeons. Come on, church. If eagles don't fly with a, with a blackbird, come on, church, a crow, it doesn't fly. Eagles fly by themselves, and they're high above all other birds. And when the winds of destruction or, or storms come, you know what an eagle does? Eagle can't wait for a storm to come. Because the eagle used that storm to climb higher. <sighs> So it's known for eagles to, to fly way above the storms. They, they roost in the highest mountain. Listen, if you'll take that attitude, say, Father, I don't care if the storms come, I'm going higher with you. I'm not flying with old buzzard head over here. <laughs> I'm not flying with old red head over here. You, you see what I'm talking about? This is what we have to do. Well, I meant to say redhead bird, amen, for, and not redhead person, amen, a redhead bird. And people get mad and say, oh, wow, you don't like redhead? No, no, I'm talking about redhead bird, amen. Now, notice what it says here in verses 2. Are you there, church? He said it's, it's easy in verse 1. Now he says, and be not conformed to this world. Don't adapt to this world. But you be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, the Bible says that you may know what is God's acceptable and perfect will of God. People say, well, I don't know what God has for me. You'll know. If you get in that word and spend time, just trust God. It, 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 one sermon can literally catapult your whole life. One scripture with God can literally add to your dimension of desire. One, one song of the words of God that we sing can literally open up an, a new way of thinking for you. See, that's what he's talking about. You know what I'm talking about? That's what he's saying. It, it's amazing. Everything that God wants is for your benefit so that you can prosper. Satan's desire is get that word away from you. Get that word away from you. That word is dangerous to you. That word will kill you, yeah? You're a liar, devil. Well, that word will make you blessed in God. Come on, church, amen. Have you ever noticed? I mean, it happens to me when I get the Bible, I get sleepy. I'm trying to read the Bible and I'm getting sleepy. But I can sure watch TV two hours. Have you ever noticed that? I can go to a movie and watch a good movie and, and sit two hours and enjoy it, but I can sit 10 minutes reading the Bible and I'll fall asleep. I say, oh, God, I'm going to sleep. That line devil. Amen? Jerry, Jerry Savelle said one day, he says, when I get sleepy, I stand on the edge of my bathtub and I read my Bible. You know what that does? Have you ever tried to balance yourself on, on the edge of your bathtub reading your Bible? Your body you ain't going to sleep standing on that edge. <laughs> Come on. Boom. <laughs> Amen. And that's so true. We have to do things. That's why I tell you, I t not, not here, but I tell people, you ever get sleepy in church, go stand in the back on that wall. Tell your body to stay awake because it's very well that works. It's going to be good for you. And the devil knows how to get you. <laughs> Say, hey, Amen. Now that you're sleeping. Amen. I, I know what I'm talking about. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's look at Galatians now. So in other words, oh, oh, go back, go, oh, go back to uh, Romans. So in other words, verse 2 says, transform your mind, transform your mind, transform your thinking, renew your thinking. That word renew, it, it, there's a prefix, re, means to, to go back to the way it should be. Uh, whenever you see a prefix in the Bible, it's telling you there is a plan that was already in existence for you, but now it's changed. So repent, return, renew. So renew means there was a way that God had you to think, but along the life's past. You change your thinking. Now he's saying renew. Go back to renew your mind and be transformed. Be transformed so that you will know, so that you will know the will of God, the peace and the, the peace of God. Can you say amen? So, so it, is, it's, it says it this way so that we can understand we've got to know the word. Go with me to Galatians. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Jesus is so good. So in other words, if God wants to be wealthy, if God wants to be blessed, 
if God wants me to, to live in he, wholeness, then, then I can trust the Lord. He's a good God. He's a good God, and the word is for me. Listen, detriments happen based upon the individual allowing the door of any, the enemy to come in. And listen, it always happens. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, think about that. Think about it in the natural realm. Have you, ever, have you ever ran in the rain, and, you, and mama told you when you were growing up, now remember, cover your head, cover your head, cover your head, and you always hear mama. You're a grown-up now, and you always hear mama. Well, you don't cover your head. You don't get a cold. You don't go. And that night, you're up with your nose all plugged up. Oh, I can't breathe. I need Vicks. Oh. And you hear mama. You told you, cover your head. See, mama loves you enough to tell you, because she's been down that road. But we get wet. And that's the detriment. You end, up, you end up having a sneeze now. You have a cold now. You have the flu. Because we ourselves do that. It's not someone putting flu on you, the sickness on you. We do that. Strife comes from that. Excuse me. Stress comes from that. Diseases. All kinds of diseases. My wife will tell you the disease that she got hit was because she had some stress levels in her life. She'll tell you. And to this day, she recognizes stress. She recognizes, ah, that's stress. I got to stay away from that. Ah, that's stress. I got to stay away. Why? Stress is deadly. But if we'll rest in his presence, and now, now we have to learn from these things. I want to learn uh, more about how we can close doors to our bodies. Notice what it says in Galatians. Say with me, amen. Galatians, hallelujah. Galatians, Paul, speaking to another group of people called uh, at Galatia. These are Galatians, another, another group of people. Galatians, the first chapter. Are you with me? Verses 12. Hallelujah. Verses 12, are you with me? Galatians 1, 12. Hallelujah. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my con conversion or conversation in the time past in the Jewish religion, how that beyond measure I was persecuted, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Come on, church. This is, the, this is and I drop down to verses 16 now. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach to him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I conferred not with flesh and blood. Verse 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were with apostles about me, but I went to Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Now, this is Paul. Get a hold of Paul. Paul was a Jewish. He, he was Jewish, but he was an arrester of the people of Jesus. He arrested Christians. When he found out after Jesus was resurrected and died, his job was to go get Christians and, and bring them before the king and have them killed. Many people were killed because of the Apostle Paul's, before he was converted, he sent many people to prison. Many people were killed. Many, the Bible says many Christians were beheaded. Many Christians were stoned. Many Christians were burned. And this was the work of Saul. But now Saul, which is Paul, he's on a road going to a certain city to arrest Christians. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on him. The Bible says he got blind. Fell off his beast. We don't know if it was a donkey, a horse, or a camel. He fell off of it. And he, the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That's Jesus saying. Now notice this. Saul wasn't killing, wasn't killing Jesus. Jesus already had died and was resurrected. But he's killing Christians. So Jesus said, why are you killing me? We're the body of Christ. So Paul on that day got converted. Saul got converted. He was blind. Made, him, made himself to a certain, some people met him, took him, and, and he converted. He got Jesus. So now, Paul is preaching about Jesus. And he says something so powerful. This is where I want you to see it. Paul said something so powerful. No man has taught me the revelation, but it comes from Jesus himself. Now notice this. Paul says it very clearly. If you study the Bible, he spent two years in the desert of Arabia, two years. And Jesus taught him for two years in the desert of Arabia. So he goes back to Jerusalem, <laughs> presents himself to the apostles, and the apostles say, he's at murder. <gasps> but here's Paul now transformed. And now they start seeing that this is a man that's transformed. He starts teaching about Jesus. Peter starts watching him. The disciples start watching him. says, oh my God. This Paul wrote three quarters 
of the New Testament. A man that Jesus taught. But notice what he tells us, and this is where I want you to see it. I conferred, and let's look at it so you can see it. Come on. And we're almost finished here. Right, hallelujah. Amen. Listen to what it says here. Are you with me, church? Oh, Father, he's so good to us. He says this. Verse 16. Well, he talks about, I came to reveal his son, Jesus, in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. So he's telling you, he's, gonna, he's got a certain group of people he's going to go minister. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now get a hold of that. I conferred not with flesh and blood. What does that mean? I don't let my mind tell me what to do. I don't let my feelings tell me what to do. And I don't let the attitudes of people tell me what to do. Isn't that amazing how people are ruled by feelings? How you feel? Come on, and say, this is yes. <laughs> this is no, or I don't know. And the reason why I say that, because it's amazing. People that have a good attitude will receive. People that have a bad attitude won't receive. So this tells me that if we have bad attitudes, we're never going to receive. But if we'll get into that word, change our attitudes, I will confirm no longer with blood and flesh. And notice this, Or Roberts, one of the greatest healing evangelists that ever lived, told Kenneth Colt, my spiritual father, Ken, when God speaks to you, refer not to flesh and blood, but do it. And that's been his principle. Now that taught me something. I will not refer. Now when we're buying this church, the first thought I mean, where are we going to get the money? We're going to get the money. We're going to get the money. We're going to get the money. Oh, 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 we'll never have it. What am I doing? That's flesh and blood right there trying to speak to me. I have to switch over to faith. Father, that's your church, Father. You'll give it to me, Lord. I know you'll give it to us. I, I don't have to worry about it, Lord. You're going to do it. But see, before I was fleshing it out, <laughs> my flesh was working. Come on. I was trying to figure out how to go get uh, $200,000. I was trying to figure out how to do this and do this and do this. I, I said, no, 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 no. That's stress. I, I'm going to rest in his presence. Father, just like you did it to Isaac, you know, respect your person. You made him rich. You can make us rich. You bless us, Lord. And little did we understand but, or physically understand that God is working behind the scenes. God is working behind the scenes. God's working with bankers. God's working with people. God's working with a realtor. God's touching the owner of this building. You met Dr. Powell. God is, is touching people. And what's going on? I refer no longer to flesh and blood. I refer no longer to flesh and blood. I refer no longer. I'll not listen to that. I'll not listen to doubt. I'll not listen to fear. Come on, church. I'll not listen. I'll not listen to doubt. And when the doctor called us and, and, and we got the phone call. We're waiting for the phone call. And the doctor, of course, they don't have bed manners. And she said, Christina, is your husband there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, he's here. Well, the negative came back. You have cancer. I looked at Christine. This is my daughter here. I looked at Christine. And I said, don't you go there. I had to get her quickly from her going, oh, oh. She literally looked at me. And she knew what I was talking about. She said, oh, she said okay, I, 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 okay, bye. What was, the, what was the thing there? See, at that very moment, she could have related to flesh and blood. That meant her trust level was not in the word, but in the person that called her, and then the disease would have increased. But she stood her ground and got on that word. We started praising God. We started declaring Jesus. We, we received the report of the Lord, not man. We thank God for the doctors, but Lord, we received the word of you. We thank you. We come against that cancer. We started going to war, believing God and taking those scriptures. And I'm telling you, until we got the breakthrough to the doctor, called her. Uh, call Christy and says, we find no cancer in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why? Why? We referred not to flesh and blood. This works with finances. You get a call about your job, don't refer to flesh and blood. Uh-uh. Father, I thank you. You got a better job for me. You get a call about reduction. No, uh, -uh. Father, I thank you. You got, a, you, you got increase. You got a bill. Say, Father, I thank you that, Lord, you, you'll handle this. You'll take care of this, God. What are you doing? You're trusting the word. You're referring not to flesh. And that's what Paul said. Amen, church? Amen. So in other words, you'll increase. Are you with me, church? You'll increase. Stand up, church. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to stand up. And, and whatever you're going through, it, 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 we're talking about um, the God of prosperity. We're talking about God uh, giving increase, the covenant of increase. Increase covers a lot. 
increase covers much in every area. But I know finances seems to be the, 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 the main mount that tax people, the lack of finances. But, but if you get your focus off money and in the Word, and listen to this, it's not about making an income. Now listen to what I'm saying, and please listen to this. You can take it wrong, and you can miss what I'm trying to say by the Holy Ghost. Income. Think about income right now. We use the word, I'm going to work, because that's my way of income. You just, you just, you just confess that that job is going to take care of you. So we say things that we don't realize what we're saying. Now notice this. Uh, income, we can say, that's my income. That's my income. That's not your income. There are many ways God could cause incoming to you. Don't just narrow it to your job as an income. No, that's a place that God provides for me to seed. That's not the place that's making my income. God is my income. God causes money to come in. When you start having that attitude, you'll start seeing income incoming. Do you see what I'm saying? Incoming, incoming. Incoming like a plane. It's incoming. It's coming. It's coming. A plane has to land. It, there it comes. It's coming. It's, it, it's coming in. Income. It, it, it's coming in. Income. So why do you say one job is your income? We ought, to have, we ought to trust God. God, there's a lot of avenues of income. Come on, church. A lot of jobs of income. Thank you, Lord. I have income coming. Thank you. Money's coming in the check. M mail. Checks in the mail are coming. Thank you, Lord. Money's coming. I'm finding money. Hallelujah. I'm finding money. Money that's been owed to me that I forgot about is coming back to me. Money that was taken to me, Lord, is coming back to me. The devil that stole from me, the Bible says, sevenfold he has to replace. I'm telling you, if the devil steals a dollar from you, you demand seven dollars back. No, don't you say, well, it's just a dollar. Pfft. Dollar times one million is a million dollars. Come on, church. See, the devil will try to take something so that you can be comfortable with that, and then he comes with something else. I tell you what, don't let the devil, if you have a flat tire, you say, uh-uh, uh, -uh. I thank God that God's provided me four new tires. Come on, church, I'm just trying to encourage you. A couple of years ago, my air conditioning went out, and we were praying for air conditioning. Air conditioning worked, 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 it was working, until finally one day it just went out, the upstairs went out. I went out there and said, ah, in Jesus' name, we're going to get new air conditions, new air conditions, new air conditions, new air We started confessing that for about six months. New air condition comes, new air conditioning comes. My house has brand new air conditions. Years ago, we got them. Come on, church. Why? Because, see, the word works. I can't limit on those air conditions to my income. Well, it's going to cost me $18,000 to get two units in my house. Well, I don't have $18,000. Well, I guess I'll just... Not use air conditioning in the house. We'll get a window unit. You, you conform. Go get a window unit. Put it in the bedroom. And that's how I conform. Uh, no, no. I, I, I thank you, God. I, I thank you. Your word says this. I call that money in. I call that air conditioning. And then it wasn't later till I met uh, <laughs> no advertisement for Bobby or Bobby's son. I met Bobby's son and uh, gave me one of the greatest deals. God did it. Come on, church. Oh, Jesus, so good. Oh, Father, you're so good. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, church, right now, just go to the Lord and say, Father, that's me. I'm, I'm like Isaac. I'm going to sow and I'm going to receive a hundredfold. I'm going to sow and I'm going to receive a hundredfold. I'm going to be very rich and rich and rich till I'm wealthy for the kingdom of God. Oh, I'm having my debts canceled. I'm having increase coming. I'm blessed of God. I believe the word. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm blessed of the Lord. I take sacrifice in coming and being under the word. I get myself under the word to know how to operate. I invest in my spiritual walk so that I can be an example unto others. Jesus, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And Father, I pray for every person hearing in this room and those that are watching by via telecast. I pray that the word of God will cause a rupture a rupture in that wall that's holding back their finances. That'll cause a breakthrough in the name of Jesus. 
And I thank you, Father, that you have made us to think like you. We get rid of wrong thinking, stinking thinking, poverty mentality. Well, we don't need much. Oh, you, you little stingy person. Well, there's much to give to the kingdom of God. Father, I thank you, Father Lord. I rebuke that stinginess, that attitude of, uh, I, I, as long as I have a roof over my head and clothes and food, that's all that matters. Oh, Father, we pray increase for the kingdom of God. Oh, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Father. We, we're not going after the love of money. We're doing the trust of you, Lord. We're talking about you, Father, a covenant of increase. A covenant of increase. And let me talk to those that are, that, uh, are having financial difficulty. Now listen to what I'm going to say. Every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're having financial, in, if you're having financial difficulty, right now examine your heart. Are you a tither? Because if we are not tithing, we cannot, or let me put it this way, the restrictions of door of the heaven of God will not open, right? But if you'll trust God, if you'll trust God and become a giver and a tither, and get in this word, you see there's principles that are, that are affected here. And get rid of that thought about, you know, their past talk about money. No, no, that's not about me. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about finances. You become a tither and you get in that word. And you get into a church that teaches like the word, teaches the word. Amen. Father, we receive that. In the name of Jesus, we receive that.